125 aircraft of the U.S. Air Force have been engaged in Operation Midnight Hammer. There were two main groups. One was tasked with attacking Iran's nuclear plants. The other was a decoy team. The centerpiece of this decoy team was a group of six B-2 stealth bombers. They were escorted by several fighters and aerial tankers for fuel supply. Likewise, the main strike package also included seven B-2 bombers and other support aircraft. The only significant difference was that the decoys kept their ADSB transponders on while taking off from the airbase. Because of this, flight trackers around the world were tracking their movements independently. It was clear that the aircraft which had taken off from Altus Air Force Base in Oklahoma were crossing the west coast of the US and flying to the Pacific. This is typically done to refuel other aircraft heading for the island of Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean which is another American airbase. While this movement captured the world's attention, the real strike package took off from Whiteman Air Force Base at 12.01 a.m. on June 21st. They were headed east, flying across the Atlantic Ocean. Their target was Iran's Fordo and Natanz uranium enrichment plants. Their destination was 11,000 kilometers from home, which is equal to the maximum range of the B-2 aircraft. But this bird was carrying two very large eggs weighing 13 tons each, which is why it could not take enough fuel to cover the maximum distance. If it had taken that amount of fuel, along with the eggs, the aircraft would have exceeded its maximum takeoff weight. So these birds took off with less fuel. Documents released by the Pentagon show that this flight refueled three times mid-air. After flying for 19 hours, the planes arrive at a point close to their target called the inbound point. As soon as they reach this position, the flight management software signals the pilot to bring the plane to a certain speed and altitude. And shortly after that comes the signal for LAR or Launch Acceptability Region. This is a few seconds long window in which the payload must be released. If the payload is not released within this time window, it will fall outside the target. Both pilots in the cockpit have to agree to drop the payload. Both pilots press the red button on the stick at 2.08 a.m. Tehran time to give their consent and release the 13 and a half tons of freedom. Being released from an altitude of 60,000 feet, this payload takes about two minutes to reach the ground. While it falls, let's learn more about this payload. Its official name is shown on the screen. Its nickname is Massive Ordnance Penetrator or MOP. The main reason for choosing this payload for this mission is that it is very effective against targets buried deep in the ground. And Iran's uranium enrichment plants are all hidden underground. These types of ordnance have the ability to withstand very strong impact. Otherwise, after hitting the ground from a height of 60,000 feet, they would have disintegrated and exploded before reaching the target deep inside. And that is why Eglin steel has been used to make its body. Eglin is six times stronger than ordinary structural steel. The MOP's total weight is 13 and a half tons, of which only two and a half tons are explosives, and the rest is just steel. The MOP is so heavy that the entire Israeli Air Force does not have a single aircraft that can carry it. Even a large aircraft like the B-2 can only carry two MOPs. Its main power does not come from explosives. The main source of energy of the MOP is its momentum. It weighs 13 and a half tons and is released from a height of 60,000 feet. Due to the release from a high altitude, it gets a lot of momentum, as a result of which its speed is almost twice the speed of sound before hitting the ground. Using this momentum, it can penetrate soft soil to a depth of 200 feet. Hence the name penetrator. However, if it encounters material harder than soft soil or if it is released from a low height, its penetrative power decreases. It is only able to penetrate 60 feet through concrete or hard rock. Due to its effectiveness in destroying bunkers underground, mops are also known as bunker busters. In addition, this mop has a large penetrator smart fuse. That is, it has the option to be programmed to control how long after hitting the ground it will explode. If it explodes in the wrong depth after piercing the ground, the mission fails. There are several electronic devices here which are known as void sensors. These sensors can calculate the acceleration of the mop, through which it senses what kind of material it is passing through and even when it has entered a void. Because the acceleration in a void or soft material is higher and the acceleration in a hard material is low. 
pilots use a weaponeering software before the flight to program this sensor or fuse. In this software, you will first create a model of the target bunker. Through proper intelligence channels, you need to know a great deal of information about the target in advance to program this fuse, such as how deep under the ground it is located, what materials have been used to reinforce it, and to what depth, how long the fuse will need to be delayed, etc. After that, you will enter which bomb you will use and where the target is located. The MOP has a GPS guidance system. The GPS receiver installed in it keeps checking its location continuously and tries to steer itself toward the target location. Grid fins are used to maneuver it. They change the direction of the MOP by moving like fish fins. If the GPS signal is jammed, there is an alternative called the INS guidance system, which we will talk about in a future video. In this way, the weaponeering software and the smart fuse work in tandem to ensure that the bunker buster reaches the right depth before it explodes. If it explodes a little earlier or later, the mission fails. Our mop is close to the target, so let's get to know this target before we liberate it. The centerpiece of the Fordo uranium enrichment plant is its centrifuge. These are located under a rocky mountain. Next to these centrifuges are two long chimneys or ventilation shaft systems resembling tridents and these are ideal places for liberation. However, concrete slabs or caps are placed on these two shaft systems. If this cap is blown, any bomb can go directly to the centrifuge. According to some experts, Iran has provided 200 feet of concrete reinforcement under this shaft under which they have placed the elusive centrifuge. If that is true, a bomb entering the shaft would only be able to penetrate 60 feet of concrete. That is, to penetrate this reinforcement, at least four bombs must be dropped down the same shaft, which is a bit like threading a needle. Only in this case, the distance from the needle to the thread is 60,000 feet. Six B-2 aircraft were used in the attack on Fordo, from which 12 mops were dropped. The Pentagon's press release shows six craters or holes. That means the mops hit at least six different spots on Fordo. Multiple possibilities have emerged here just like Schrodinger's cat. Maybe they dropped two mops on six spots, which means the maximum penetration is only 120 feet, which is not enough to reach the centrifuge. Or they could have dropped four mops on two spots and one on the remaining four spots in which case it would be possible to reach the centrifuge at two spots but not at the remaining four. Since the Pentagon has not released any of their shot grouping and battle damage assessment, it is difficult to say for sure what the extent of the damage actually was. But one thing is clear, that with the right intelligence, it is possible to partially, if not completely destroy these plants with 12 mops. So is a celebration by the Trump administration just a vain boast? The game of international geopolitics is like 4D chess. Things are rarely what they seem. Satellite images from a few days before midnight hammer show several trucks removing goods from Fordo. So was this attack just a sham? Did both sides know everything in advance? Only time will tell.